Hi, good morning, everybody. So good to see all of you here today. Can we honor our worship team? Amen. Elaine, that was absolutely amazing. I was, I was just down there just now. Uh, I felt like I was kind of like in the space of my own and, you know, just encountering God, you know, feeling His manifest presence. You know, God's presence is with us all the time. But, you know, when we come together, there is a corporate anointing. And today, it was so evident, you know, as I was uh, there preparing for to share with you this morning. And today, we actually have our Huyos team, you know, our young people. Aren't they amazing? You know, uh, if you have young people, bring them to our Huyos Gen uh, youth service on the Saturdays because these people lead worship there as well, and, and, and it's amazing. So yes, I want to say hello to everyone here uh, at Covenant Vision, right here in our midst. I also want to say hello to those who are with us, joining us on uh, YouTube as well. I want to say hi to you. Those people even who are going to watch after, because they're at Encounter Weekend. We have a whole group of them at Encounter Weekend this morning. I'm going to watch the YouTube after they come back from Encounter Weekend. I want to say hi to you and acknowledge your presence as well. And I pray that this message will bless you. You know, before I begin... Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you, Lord. We are just in awe, Lord, of who you are. Lord, you are great. You are mighty. You are awesome in power, Lord. And today, Lord, we, we, as we come together as, as, as a church body, we are so thankful, Lord, that we have a place together. And Father, we are thankful as well, Lord, that you are moving us into a new season. Lord, we are in that season now, but physically you're going to move us to a new premises. But Father, we are your church doesn't matter where we are, you are with us. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, as we move into the new season. Lord, as we are crossing over into the new season, Father, Lord, you, you show us, Lord. You show us um, your purposes, your plan, and your call for us as we move to Little Road. And Father, we thank you also, Lord, today, Lord, as we hear this message, uh, Victory to Valley. Father, Lord, that you open our hearts. Father, Lord, sometimes messages can be a little bit difficult to, to, to share, but Father, we know, Lord, this is your word. We want to preach your word. We want to be true to your word this morning. And so I ask, Father, Lord, that you hide me behind the cross. Father, Lord, that, you, that it would only be your words that I speak today. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you, you will, that the Holy Spirit in us, you know, as, even as we've prayed and sung today, Lord, fall afresh on us, that the Holy Spirit in us will be our teacher. The Holy Spirit in us Lord, would open our eyes and illumine our hearts, Lord, to your truth this morning. And, and Father, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is here. And so, Father, we bless you this morning. We thank you. We, we honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So, last year, um, last quarter of last year, Reverend Francis shared with us that he sensed that we are going into a season of crossover, isn't it? And so as a church, we, or some of us, you know, we, we, we've decided for me to go through the book of, uh, the first few chapters of the book of Joshua, you know, to learn from the Israelites crossing over into the promised land. And, you know, we thank God for technology. So if you're joining us for the first time, we're a little bit into the book of Joshua already, but, you know, thank God for technology. You can go back to, to our YouTube channel and, and actually go and review some of the messages uh, on the book of Joshua. And I started actually with, um, uh, with a message called Strength and uh, be strong and courageous. And because we wanted to follow the Israelites' uh, journey, as I mentioned, um, led by Joshua into the promised land. But, you know, God told Joshua to be strong and to be courageous, isn't it? Because they were going into a, a place that was already inhabited. And so they had to be strong and courageous because a war was ahead of them. But at the same time, they had to be strong and courageous to, to keep to the word of God. And lastly, they could be strong and courageous because God said, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. My presence will go with you. And then they prepared to cross the Jordan River, isn't it? They were supposed to get 
get themselves ready to get set to cross the Jordan River. And God told Joshua, you need to do a few things first. First, you have to set yourself, get the Israelites to set themselves apart. First, ceremonially, they had to be holy because the presence of God was going to, in the form of the Ark of the Covenant, was going to go with them across the river. They were to set themselves apart, and then they were to set off after the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant was going to go before them. You know, and as the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant, they put the feet into the water, and then the waters receded. And the Israelites were able to go across the river. But the Ark of the Covenant was right in the center of the riverbed as the Israelites crossed over. But they were supposed to follow the Ark of the Covenant. And after they crossed over, the Ark of the Covenant then left the river. And so God's presence was going before them, was in the midst of the river, and the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence, would go after them as well. And then... Because they set up, set up a memorial, you know, remember what I had done for you. And so they set up a memorial with the stones that they took from the river, and they were not only supposed to remember, but they were supposed to tell their children about it. Every time the children see this, this, this Baymax-looking thing, tell them, tell them about what God had done. And then they set up at this place called Gilgal, remember I was telling you, that it was like base camp. Gilgal was like the base camp. And I used this term to um, sort of, because at that time, you know, our, uh, the COVID-19 situation, we were going to release phase three. And our minister said, we are like at base camp, you know. The, the ascent is still fraught with danger. And so I, I borrowed that, that phrase because the Israelites at Gilgal, it was like base camp. You know, they had preparation. There was a time of preparation. But at the same time, they would go out and come back and go out and come back from Gilgal as well. And so at base camp, what did Joshua have to do? He had to circumcise the men. And, you know, it was, you know, sometimes you think about circumcision and it's, it's a painful process. But the thing is that all the men who had come out, who had come out, uh, all the men who had come out of uh, Egypt, had perished in the wilderness, and all the men who were in the wilderness, they were not circumcised. And you know, circumcision is a mark of the covenant that God made with Abraham. And without the mark, they could not inherit the promised land. It was God's grace to prepare them, even physically, with circumcision, to be able to enter the promised land. But the same, then after that, after they healed and everything, it took a while in enemy territory. You know, they were, they were sort of like incapacitated in enemy territory. But God is not in, in a hurry, yeah? God is not in a hurry. And he made sure that they were all healed. They took the Passover. They celebrated and commemorated what God had done, bringing them out of slavery from Egypt. And then, you know, Joshua himself had a, a little encounter with the commander of the army of the Lord. You know, before you even set, start your conquest, he worshipped, he worshipped. And then they were there. Jericho was right in front of them. And it was an exercise in faith as they took Jericho. Because God, God's military strategy was certainly not any military strategy that we will see today, isn't it? go march around Jericho one time for six days. Go round, go round, go round, go round. <laughs> Who would imagine this is a good military strategy? But that was God's military strategy. And on the seventh day, they walked around seven times and they did a big shout and the walls came down. They were seizing by faith. You know, our, our theme for this year is to seize by faith. And by faith, in, in what they did, they were able to take Jericho. But there was also a little story about a woman called Rahab, you know, who, who before they crossed over, uh, she, she had saved two spies that had gone into Jericho to suss out the land. And she actually also uh, had an exercise in faith on her own to risk her life and to save the two spies. And she and her family, because of that, were saved by the Israelites, and they became the first Canaanite 
converts, isn't it, uh, to, the, to, to the God of Israel. And so that really is the backstory. And now we are right here in Joshua chapter 7. Okay, the last verse of Joshua chapter 6 actually is, is this. After Jericho, after they took Jericho, the last verse says, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. It's great, right? Sounds good, right? And then Joshua chapter 7 starts with a three-letter word. And the three-letter word is, but. You know, so far in the account that we've gone through, it has been very positive, right? Minus the circumcision of the guys. Like, okay, that one may not be so positive. But so far, it's been positive. You know, they conquer, you know. It's been so far so good. But... And in this chapter, we will see that Israel actually faces their first defeat. Their first defeat in the promised land. And even though we really like the conquest, we like the seizing by faith, you know, we need to also heed the warnings in the account. We need to know that um, we are not, it will not always be like that. And so in Joshua chapter 7, we will see that actually victories can reveal and or distract us from our vulnerabilities. We are all vulnerable. And so, you know, the first verse in Joshua 7, it says this, but the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Okay, there's this guy here. Sometimes I like to joke and say this is the first uh, Cantonese guy. <laughs> Achan. <laughs> Actually, it's not a chan. Uh, if you listen to some of the Americans, they call him Aiken, but the correct pronunciation is Ahan. Ahan. Okay, so I shall attempt to use the correct pronunciation. Okay, so the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things, but Ahan, the son of Kami, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. And so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. That was going on, right? Actually, if you, before they took Jericho, God gave them a very specific instruction. When you go in, and let's re- review very quickly, in Joshua 6, 18 to 19, before they took Jericho, God said, keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Instruction was given. But the Bible tells us that Ahan actually took some of the devoted things for himself and hid it. And so, all of Joshua's army, everyone actually obeyed the Lord except for this one man. But if you notice, God was angry with the entire Israel. And here we see national solidarity. You know, God is, you know, when one part of the body hurts, so the whole, whole body hurts. This whole idea, we will see it play out right here. Because of this one man's sin, God withholds his blessing from the entire Israel as they prepare, as they continue on their conquest of the promised land. And they were going to, they were going to uh, take the next city. The city is called Ai, A-I. Okay? And we will come back to this whole concept of national solidarity later. But here, we need to know, in, after chapter, after, in, in, verse, in chapter 7, Joshua actually doesn't know that Ahan had actually uh, sinned. Okay? Joshua doesn't know. Okay, so let's move on first. And so, you know, as per Joshua's SOP, you know, standard operating procedure, he was sent spies, correct? So far, we we, we see see him do that. He sends spies, okay, to suss out I, okay? And they come back. They come back not only with a good report, but they come back with a strategy of their own. Okay, so let's see here. So when they returned in Joshua 7, verse 3 to 5, when they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army have to go up against Ai. Okay? Send two or three thousand men to take it and do not weary the whole army, for for only a few people live there. 
So about 3,000 of them went up, and they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Does this sound familiar? Previously, whose heart melted with fear? It was the enemy's heart. The enemies were scared of the Israelites. But in this case, because of what happened in Ai, the tables were turned and the Israelites were scared. Their hearts melted like water. Their hearts melted in fear and became like water. You know, if you, if you read this account, just, just right here alone, some things will strike you. Okay, the first thing is, number one, they did not pray nor seek God for His direction and His leading. And it seemed like they were very much in a hurry, isn't it? Oh, Jericho, really next, which is the next city? Which is the next city I'm going to take? You know, they, they didn't pray. They didn't seek God, especially Joshua. Ay, ay, ay. You know, Joshua had always been very, you know, he's, he was always good to seek God, you know, ask him for what to do next, and God had always given him instruction. But right here, right here, Joshua not only did not seek God, he relied on the information of men from his people. The thing is, if Joshua had inquired of the Lord before they went up to take Ai, the Lord would surely have revealed the sin of Ahan. Isn't it? God knows, and He would have revealed because their victory is, is something that God wants. But because Joshua did not seek God, because they did not seek God, they were defeated. They ran ahead of God. I think very naturally it's because of their recent victory. So they would say, okay, I assume, you know, God's, God's favour is with us already. God's favour will be continue to be with us even in the next city and the next city and the next city and the next city. They assumed. Furthermore, furthermore, the spies themselves underestimated the enemy. Do you know that when you underestimate the enemy, you're actually overestimating your own strength? They underestimated the enemy. I actually, you know what he said here, that they had actually very few men. But I actually have had 12,000 men. His people, Joshua's guys, spies, said, oh, just said two or 3,000 of our people. But if you, if you read further on in Joshua chapter 8, actually, I had 12,000 men. Naturally, they were out, would have been outnumbered. But you see, the spies, they depended on their physical eyes to see, their own self-assessment. And based on their, what they saw with their eyes, they made an evaluation, a self-evaluation of the enemy. And they came up with their own strategy and they told that to Joshua. And Joshua, without consulting God, agreed. It was a big mistake that caused 36 of their men to die and despair and discouragement in the camp. So, you know, when you see this, oh yeah, they sent, you must realize that we have a vulnerability when we are victorious. And the first is that we are vulnerable to complacency and self-reliance. This is vulnerability number one. I am sure this happens to all of us. It happens to me, okay? It happens to me. After a victory, after something goes well, um, naturally what I want to do is I want to kick up my legs. You know, I give myself a pat on the back. Oh, you did so well. And then I let my guard down. <laughs> Beware. Because it is at this point that you are vulnerable. That you are vulnerable. That you start to begin to rest. To not rest in God, but to rest on your laurels. <laughs> Sometimes people wonder, and... I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but after a victory, immediately you feel attacked. You know, something happens, you know, victory, and then boom, something happens. Don't underestimate the enemy. 
Because the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, that to be alert and be sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He is there when you are victorious, okay? And he's waiting. He's waiting for you to fall into complacency. He's waiting for you to fall into self-reliance. Sometimes you can, you, can, you can sense, you can sense it. Oh, you did so well. You did so well already. You can do it again. Don't need to pray. Did it before what? You can do it again. Know that the devil knows that complacency is just right around the corner. Also, when something goes well, you might question, okay? Was this God or was this me? And sometimes this will play to your pride. Was it really God or was it me who did it? Was it my talents? God gave me the talents, what? So actually, it's God, but actually it's me. <laughs> and so then you start to depend on yourself. And this, this really plays, the devil really knows how to play to our pride. Play to our pride. And then we become, we move from God-reliance to self-reliance. Beware. Remember that God is working in and through us all the time. It's not us to take the credit, but it is God. Because in Philippians 2.13, it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? For it is God, not you. It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. It is God, ultimately, behind the scenes, working. We like to sing the song, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, we work. God is there. And the danger is that we take credit for what God has done and then we fall into self-reliance. So then how? Then how, right? And I, I, I will share with you that this is sort of like my, my own um, ways to guard against this. The first is actually whenever I face a victory or whenever I face that things, things are going well, the first thing I always want to do is reflection. Actually, reflection is something that we should do every single day. Reflection. Because when we reflect on what's, what's gone on in the day, and we, can, we should come to a point of thanksgiving. We should come to a point to say, God, it is you, and I thank you. I thank you for bringing me to this point. We need to be thankful. You know, I keep a, I keep a thanks, Thanksgiving journal. And some people, when, I, when we talk about journaling, people think that, oh, it has to be but this nice, you must write a lot, must write a lot. They must have nice cursive writing. It's not all the time like that. Let me tell you, my, my thankful journal is actually a, a little diary that I keep. It's like one week on two pages. And each, each, uh, each day is only so much. But it, 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 because it's only so much, it helps me remember. I don't need to write a long, long story. I need to reflect and come to the point and know that I need to be thankful to God because of this. And I don't write it down. But... It's purposeful reflection and purposeful thanking God and being reliant on Him. The second thing is to, to guard yourself against complacency and self-reliance is to be accountable to somebody. To be accountable to somebody and to be able to receive feedback. Sometimes uh, when our heads grow very big, uh, we don't know, we can't tell. And sometimes what you need is someone to come and take a little pin and boop. And remind us, hey, it's not you. Ah. Hey, did you pray? Ah? You sound, you, you, it seems like you're running ahead of God, you know. Are you sure? Did you pray? Did you ask God that this is where He wants you to go? And we need that. That's why we cannot be by ourselves. We need people around us. And we need people whom we have allowed access into our lives to tell us when we are vulnerable, especially to complacency and especially to self-reliance. Thankfully, as we go, since we're talking about Thanksgiving, but thankfully, you know Joshua, when this happened, what did he do? 
The Bible tells us that he was quick to go straight to God. He was quick to go straight to God. He and his elders went to the Ark of the Covenant. They put dust on their heads. Can you imagine it today? You put dust on your head. <laughs> I cannot imagine. But they, they went straight to God. They went to the Ark of the Covenant. They fell down and like, what's going on, God? The thing is, they sought God for why. And that is what we should do. When, when, when we come to valley situations, we need to ask God why. Do you know, one of my favorite uh, uh, passages, okay, my favorite book is James. Okay? The, my favorite book in the Bible is James. Okay, not because my husband is James, but one of my favorite books in the Bible is James. And in James 1, 2 to 5, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces patience. And where, do we, where is uh, patience um, tested in the valleys, right? And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. If anyone lacks wisdom, what kind of wisdom is James talking about? Wisdom as to why you're in the valley. In the context of this passage, it is wisdom to know why you're going through the trial you're going through. And we need to know why. And God says, I, you, you ask me, I will tell you. I will not find fault. I'll tell you why you're going through this valley. And so Joshua goes there. Oh, he thought, what's going on? And then it says, then the Lord says to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep, and they have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen, they have lied, they have put it with them in their own possession. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. And here, he says, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. You know, in Joshua 1, God says, I will be with you wherever you go, right? I will not leave you for, or forsake you, but sin. Because of sin, he says, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever is among you is devoted to destruction. Then he says, then, he, then God gives Joshua direction. Go, Consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. Why? For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemy until you remove them. In the morning, this is the evening. Huh? So the next day, he's saying, in the morning, present yourselves, tribe by tribe. The, Lord, the tribe the Lord chooses shall come forward, clan by clan. Am I there already? Yeah, clan by clan. And the clan the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Whoever is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. In essence, God is saying, I am going to reveal the men. I am going to reveal the perpetrator. Actually, because God knows, right? Actually, Joshua, the whole of Israel don't know. Only the, the perpetrator knows, right? And so, Joshua is telling them, tomorrow morning, the perpetrator will be revealed. And that's what happened. The next morning, Joshua brought all the people together, and literally, one by one, first the tribe came forward, then the clan came forward, then the family came forward. I mean, God is the one who revealed to Joshua because no one knows. And then finally, God said, this is the man, Achan. You see, there was, there was sin in the camp and Achan was disobedient. And after, after this person was revealed, okay, Joshua then asked him, and he was very sweet, okay? Joshua is a very tender man, apparently. See, he says, my son, 
Give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what is it that you have done and do not hide it from me. And he replies, it is true. It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. And here we see a confession. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. We are vulnerable to sin and disobedience. Let me just say that it is not that we are not vulnerable to sin other times, but when we, are, when, when we go through victories, it distracts us from the fact that we are always vulnerable to sin. We are always vulnerable to being disobedient to the Lord. And Ahan's sin is familiar. He, he had hidden sin. Hidden sin. And how does hidden sin come about? He saw, he coveted, he took, and he hid. We, we, we see this in other parts of the Bible as well. Adam and Eve. Eve saw, of course, she was instigated by the serpent, but she coveted that knowledge of good and evil. She took, she got Adam to take it as well, and then they hid from God. You look at King David. He saw Bathsheba, loved how she looked, coveted her, and took her as possession, and tried to hide his sin by getting rid of her husband, sending him out to war. That's how hidden sin starts to manifest. Right? We see, we want... We take a second look, we want some more. We take a third look, we want some more, and then we take it. But what makes it bad is that we then hide it. Hide it. You see, the tendency is for us to then is to give in to temptation. But what we don't realize is how seriously God takes sin. How seriously God takes sin. He told Joshua there is no victory to be had until sin is dealt with. Hidden sin is dangerous. Not only that, Achan tried to rationalize his sin. You know why? Because he, in, instead of using the, the term devoted things, when he actually confessed, he instead of saying devoted things, these are, I took the devoted things, he used the word plunder. He used the word plunder. Which means he actually had a wrong understanding of holy war, that he didn't think that those things belonged to God, that it was his for the taking. And sometimes we, like when we come to sin, sometimes we can rationalize in a way. What, does not God want us to be, feel, to have pleasure? Does not God want me to be happy? We can rationalize sin away just as a hun rationalized his sin away. He thought, okay, I'm one out of two million. Who is to know? Who is to know, right? But God knows. How can what I alone do affect the entire Israel? But let me tell you, friends, never underestimate the amount of damage one person can do outside the will of God. Earlier this year, we saw a report that came out uh, of a very... It was very hard for me when I, when I saw the report on Ravi Zacharias and, and what had transpired over the, the, the course of the last decade. He had hidden sin and it was brought to light, unfortunately, after he passed away. We don't even know if he managed to repent, whether he managed to confess. Obviously. If there was a confession, it would have been, had to have been public because of the extent of the sin. But he had hidden sin. And after he passed away, when everything came out, do you, has it not affected us? One man's sin can affect all of the body of Christ. 
I have, I have felt so, I had, I had to have like at least a, a few weeks of just wrestling with what it meant for the body of Christ, what it meant for us. I honoured the man. I read his book. It made so, I am so, I was so upset <laughs> with what, what happened. But I felt so sad for the victims as well. And that should drive us to realise that every single one of us is vulnerable. Every single one of us is vulnerable to sin. You might say, okay, Rabbi Zacharias, okay, he's like one man. He's like, he has a following of many million, okay. But when we engage in sin, hidden sin, and we rationalise that sin away and allow it to fester in our lives, it will affect us. It will affect our family as it did with Ahan. We need to guard ourselves against and how it affects his family, we will see. But how do we counter? How do we counter the vulnerability to sin? First of all, know your weakness. Know your weakness. Be aware of the pitfalls that affect you and how vulnerable you are to temptation. Never, ever, ever think that you are not vulnerable. You know, the best defense, we always say, is a good offense, right? To know also your weapons, to put on the armor of God. Pastor Adrian shared this in his two-part series, Dressed for Battle. Go review that. You know, many times in the New Testament, we are told, flee temptation. Don't entertain. Flee. Flee youthful lusts, error, greed, sexual immorality. Flee. Don't give it a second look. Don't allow it to have the light of day in your life. Friends, if you are harboring hidden sin, please, please bring it to Jesus. If you need help, let us, your pastors, your DG leaders know. We want to walk you through it, but don't let it continue. You need to be quick to confess and to repent. Do you know I believe that this very strange and dramatic way that Ahan was identified was actually God's grace. You know, first of all, the whole night, he actually had the whole night to come forward because Joshua already told them that I am going to, God is going to reveal the perpetrator tomorrow morning. He had the whole night to think about, to come forward and to repent. More than that, you know, as, as, as the whole proceedings were going on, he had that time to confess, to repent, to say, I did it. Do you know as a parent, right? My son's right here. Sometimes when I want, I know that he has to confess something. I know he has to say something. What do I do? I give you 10, ten counts. Huh? One, two. What am I doing when I wait? I am giving him a chance to come out and say what he's done. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like when, the, when they are coming out one by one, right? It is, a, it is grace, you know. This tribe, this clan, this family. And he said nothing. Ahan said nothing. The time was for him to come out and say, I did it. You know why? Because the Bible, although the Old Testament, it seems like God is like fierce and all that. He, yes, he hates sin, but he is also merciful. Did he not forgive David who murdered? Did he not? He did. And if Ahan had come forward, I believe with all my heart that God would have forgiven him. If he had confessed and said, I'm sorry, these are the things, I'm going to put it back now. God, in his mercy, would have. So Joshua sends the messengers and they ran to the tent, right? Oh, where am I? Yeah. And there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread, spread them out before the Lord. Oh, okay. So all of, all his things, they had to Make sure that it was correct, right? So they went there, they took all these things, and then they laid it out. 
And indeed, a hand had sinned. Then Joshua, then Joshua, together with all Israel, took a hand, son of Zerah, the silver, the rope, the gold bar, his sons, his daughters, his cattle. Oh, yeah. And his sheep and his donkey, his tent and all that he had to the valley of Ahor. And Joshua said, here, he said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all of Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. And then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, the place has been called the Valley of Ahor ever since. So Achan and his entire family had to be punished by death. And you think, huh? It was him what? Why his family also had to suffer, right? If you see in Deuteronomy 24, 16, it actually says that parents are not to be put to death for their children. Parents, thank God. Nor children put to death for their parents, for each will die for their own sins. You know what this means? This tells us actually that the, fa the family was complicit in the sin. They knew what their father had done, and they also hid. You see, one man's sin, it was him who coveted, him who took, him who hid. But the family was implicated. The head of the household is, is, is an important man in the family, and if he says, hide, hide, ah, but they knew. And so the family was implicated in his sin as well. Not only his family, the whole of Israel was implicated. The 36 men whose families would not have a father anymore were also affected. You know, the, the word valley of Ahor, Ahor actually means trouble. So the thing is, we all get into trouble, isn't it? We all do. Is there no hope? Is there no hope at all when we get into trouble? You know, the valley of Ahor, this term, is mentioned two other times. Once in Isaiah 65.10 and Hosea 2.15. And I will just put up the Hosea verse here. It says, and this is, this is of Israel, There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Ahor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, and in the day she came out of Egypt. The valley, the place of defeat and trouble, can become a door of hope. It can become a door of hope. It doesn't have to remain. Don't remain in the valley. You know, this, this defeat, this defeat was Israel's only defeat the one and only defeat in their conquest of the promised land. And you know, this message is actually called Victory to Valley because it, it, in, in Joshua chapter 7, it shows from victory how they got into defeat. But it should not end there. It should be from victory to valley, back to victory again. Because in chapter 8, in Joshua chapter 8, we see how God then brings the Israelites to victory over Ai. He brings them through the actual conquest of this city. It's quite a dramatic conquest. So I'm not going to go through it today, but you know, you take your time. And this is the last of uh, the series of Joshua for a while now because we have a, um, a whole new series coming out after Resurrection Sunday. But I would encourage you to read chapter 7 in your time this week and then chapter 8 and to see that you don't have to remain in that valley, in that place of defeat. But you can go on to be victorious again. You know, this account in Joshua 7 and then in Joshua 8, it shows us that yesterday's victory does not make us immune from defeat today. Okay, we are not immune from defeat. 
but we must realize, and we must realize that we, we, we can be prone to complacency after a victory, and we need to continually, continually depend on God for strength, on Him, not on ourselves, for strength. We must also realize and remember that God takes sin really seriously. And if we take a good hard look at ourselves, there's actually a little achan in all of us. With our tendency to either make light of sin or to hide things from God. Yet, in God's mercy, He has given us the solution to sin. Jesus right? At that time, of course, there was no Jesus. But we today, God has given us that solution to sin, that Jesus came down to earth to live a sinless life and to die the death that we all deserved. Jesus took upon himself all our sins so that we can be reconciled with God. You know, from next Sunday onwards, we will be commemorating Holy Week, Holy Week. And it's such an important week in, in the Christian calendar because we remember, we remember what Christ has done for us. I want to encourage you to come for Holy Week as well. The thing is that when we acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior, we are forgiven. And we ask Him to forgive our sins. We come forward and repent. We have time now. <laughs> before, the, the, before God comes again, we have time to ask God to forgive our sins and repent and, and to live as sons and daughters of God. But this doesn't mean that we are no longer vulnerable, right? It doesn't, but it does mean that we can still rise from the ashes of defeat if we remember that God has already won the victory over sin and death for us. It's never that we don't fall into valleys, but it's how fast we climb out of them is how fast we climb out of them. In Joshua 8, they do. They defeat I. When we surrender to the Lord, no defeat is permanent. No defeat is permanent. And no mistake is beyond remedy. Even the valley of trouble, the valley of Ahor, can actually become a door of hope for all, all of us. And we can go from victory to valley, but to victory again. I want to invite the, the worship team, and we're, we're just going to pray. You know, if, if you've heard this message, and I'm speaking also to people who have joined us online on, on YouTube, if you've heard this message and, and, and you've been stirred in your heart, you know, know that Jesus is the solution. Jesus is your answer. And, you have, and if you have never, and if you have never acknowledged Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and if you felt stirred in your heart today and you want to acknowledge Him as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity today. I want to give you that opportunity if you've never acknowledged Him. Because, you know, without Christ, we will constantly be in that valley place because we are apart from God. I want to give you that opportunity, opportunity to acknowledge Lord, Savior, as Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And if that is you today, will you pray this prayer with me? Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I acknowledge that you sent Jesus to die and he rose again after three days victorious over sin and death. Today, I acknowledge Jesus Christ as my Savior and as my Lord. I turn away and I repent from my past and from my sin. And I turn to you today. I declare that today I am a child of the living God. That all things have passed away and all things have become new. 
Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If that is you today, and if you have prayed that prayer with us, can you please contact us? We want to talk to you. We want to bring you through. We want to explain to you the new hope that you have in Jesus. And we want to celebrate with you as well. You know, for the rest of us, let us rise. And I want to pray with you this, this morning. If you today are going through a valley season, a season where you feel that you've been in absolute defeat and sorrow. I want to pray for you. I also want to pray for those who feel that they are vulnerable to complacency, to, to, to self-reliance, and are struggling with sin. So, for all of us, why don't every single one of us, let's put our hands on our heart and, and, and let me pray for you today. Father God, we, we, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word reveals so much to us. And Father, today, Lord, I want to pray, especially for those who are in seasons of valleys, Lord, where they feel so utterly defeated, Lord. But Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word tells us that we can come into your presence, Lord. Lord, we can come to you. We do not need to stay in that place. But Father, I pray, Lord, that you will reveal your heart for every single one of these people who feel that they, 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 they've lost, that they can't crawl out. But Father, I pray, Lord, that your, your hand, your mighty hand will lift them up, oh Lord. Lord, that they will see that, that they are loved. That there is hope in Christ. That there is always hope in Christ. Lord, whatever situation it may be, Lord, even for, for us, for us, we recognize, Lord, that today that we are so prone to, to, to complacency. We are prone to being self-reliant. Father, we ask, Lord, that you forgive us, Lord. You forgive us, Lord. Lord, we want to always repent. Lord, if you are showing us today areas in which we need to repent from, areas in which we need to, uh, to, to, to surrender to you, show us, Lord. Show us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that's in every single one of us today. The Holy Spirit that, that, that convicts us of sin. Holy Spirit that reveals but the Holy Spirit that also shows us, Lord, that you are a God of love and mercy. And so, Father, I just pray for my brothers and my sisters here, even those online, Lord, that we will not stay in those places or valleys, but we will remember that you have already won the victory. Lord, that we can be victorious because you have been victorious. We can be not just a conqueror, but a super conqueror in Christ. We can be more than conquerors. And so, Father, Lord, we, we, we commit. Uh, Lord, I, I just commit my entire, everyone here today to you, Lord. Lord, even in our time of being thankful, being grateful to you and self-reflection, Father, you, you, you bring, make those moments of prayer rich, Lord, that our hearts will be so enriched with your love, Lord. And so, Father, I just want to commit. I thank you, Lord, for everyone who has prayed, everyone who has committed, and everyone who, who seeks, Lord, to live in victory again, Father, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they will, they will find it in Christ and in Christ alone. And so, Father, we thank you. We honor you. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.